Are you looking to become a better real estate investor? Then hang on because you're about to experience another episode of the world's most popular real estate podcast, The Bigger Pockets Podcast. But before we get to this week's show, I wanted to invite you to become part of our community, biggerpockets.com, the real estate investing social network. The membership is free and you'll instantly gain access to networking opportunities, educational content, investor tools, and more. Sign up now and get a free copy of our book, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing, read by hundreds of thousands of budding entrepreneurs. Just click this link right here or just head to biggerpockets.com. With that, let's get to the show. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 53. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. Hey, everybody. What's going on? This is Josh Dorkin, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast here with Brandon Turner. Hey, Brandon. It always cracks me up when you when you start with the, hey, and did you hear my dog in the background? That's my new Dude, puppy. I, I did not, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's my cute new puppy. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all's well. Things are things are happening. January is uh, is starting to really pick up. Lots of new people hopping on the site, and and uh, you know the the podcast as well. Actually, last week our our show with Ken McElroy was that was a that was a huge hit. Huge hit. People love that show. So if, yeah. if you haven't listened to it, go listen to it after this one, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely do. Show fifty two biggerpockets dot com slash show fifty two. Well, speaking of tips. Why don't we uh, jump to today's quick, quick tip. tip. Quick tip. All right. Today's quick tip. We have a forum on Bigger Pockets, which is uh, called the Success Stories Forum. Say that 10 times fast. Success Stories. Um, <laughs> and uh, not only is that well worth checking out to get inspired by your peers, but we really, really, really re- recommend you... Uh, Take every little success that you have and share it because you know the more visible, the more public you are with, with your accomplishments, the more people who see that you're doing good things, you're being successful, and as a result, you're going to attract new investors and, and other folks to uh, uh, you know, look into you and, and check you out. So definitely recommend checking out the Success Story Forum. Um, I also recommend when you're recording a show – you don't text somebody on your <laughs> cell phone. As I sit here, I'm watching Brandon texting. I don't know who he's texting. My, but my electrician. <laughs> somewhat disrespectful, Brandon. Uh, you were going on and on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're, you're having electricity problems? Yeah, I got a hot water heater electrical problem. Anyway. Nice. Yeah, I'll deal with nice. it. Well, I, I got a boiler problem, so, yeah. you know. Yeah, we all I got agree. problems. All right. It's anyway. very snarky. All right, so today we've got uh, got a pretty cool guy uh, uh, as as our our guest on the show. We've we've got Jason Hull uh, from HullFinancialPlanning dot com. He's a uh, he's a financial planner, obviously, and uh, a real estate investor who who takes a little bit more of a conservative approach to his investing than than some of our other guests. So. I, I definitely think you guys are going to enjoy hearing his thoughts, his stories, and his his strategies. You know, everybody's got a different way of going about it, and it's it's I don't know. I think it's pretty fascinating to check it out. I had a, had a opportunity to hang out with um, with Jason at a at a conference uh, a couple months ago, and uh, we had a lot of fun. So it's kind of cool to have him here on the show. I know Brandon, he got to spend like hours and hours cooking at an airport or something. I, I think, I'm sure we'll, we'll learn more about that as, as we go on. That, but, you, that, uh, that you will. Yes, yes. All right. Well, with that, let's, let's hop into the show here. Jason, nice to have you. Welcome, welcome aboard. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's good to, good to reconnect again. I know we hung out quite a bit uh, a few months back at a conference and uh, we hung out at the airport afterwards, which was fun too. So yeah, it's always fun to yes. hang out with you. It was you. a lot of fun watching the people uh, people walking by and, and noting the interesting fashion trends at the airport. <laughs> you guys yes. sound really exciting. Boy, I want to <laughs> hang out with you. Well, we had like, like what, like three, four hours to wait for our flight, so we just sat there and yeah, chatted. Right. So anyway, let's, that's awesome. Yeah, really people, interesting. People Gotta don't tell care you, about I, that. You know. Can you keep talking about that? 
It's not nearly as interesting as seeing some Grammy winner at the car wash. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, Josh did see a Grammy winner at the car wash. I didn't well, see a Grammy winner. Whose name he cannot recall. Oh, stop. <laughs> You guys are being annoying. All right, let's start this. Can we? Can we start here? And <laughs> All right, stop ripping at each other. You guys, like seriously. All right, let's let's do this. Uh, Jason, so how did you get into real estate investing? Well, I was I was in the army, and I I got out of the army, and I had about six months between the last day that I had to show up for work in Fort Knox and the first day of law school in Virginia, and I was bored, and I was watching late night television, and there was this real estate investing secrets infomercial and it looked really interesting (laughs) and so i actually attended the seminar the little free seminar that they give where it's basically two hours of pitch for joining their course and this that and the other and hey i thought i could make millions of dollars no money down flipping real estate and so that's actually how i got into real estate investing was i got suckered in to a uh to an infomercial nice Uh, fortunately i've i've learned some lessons since then (laughs) But uh, yeah, that that first introduction, uh, it, it was these people that were, you know, his associates and advisors, and and you know, realistically, he was making a lot more money off of selling these info infomercial products than he ever did off of real estate. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. I, I tend to think that about most of the the salespeople out there, they make far more off of the sales than they do off of uh, actual the real estate, but. You know, it's a good business. It is a good business. Good business. Yeah. yeah. Why are Why are we yeah. doing real estate? Come on, we should just go on the road, Josh. You and I could have nice. some fun. <laughs> we we can, can, just got the hair that this guy had. <laughs> we could we could bring Jason That's with true. us. You know, hang out at airports, you know, pick people up. <laughs> Instead of the people that are offering the credit card offers as you walk by the yep. gates, it could be the three of us offering some sort of infomercial product. There you go. There, there you go. go. I like it. That'd be awesome. Ah, all right, so so you got quote suckered in to to this this whole thing, and now did did that actually lead to you getting started, or or did yeah. that okay okay it did it it actually led to my first deal okay um, my first deal was in a little town right outside of Fort Knox called Elizabeth Town. Uh, it was a VA foreclosure. It was a four bedroom, two and a half bath, just your typical. It was a, a cookie cutter neighborhood, almost like a Levitt town. Um, and fortunately, it didn't really require any uh, anything in, in terms of fixing it up, getting it right. It was ready to rent, ready to move in the first day. Of course, I thought I could buy it. I haven't gone through this infomercial. I thought I could buy it, slap on a coat of paint, add twenty five percent to the list plot, to the price, list it, and sell it. Which was, of course, fallacious thinking because there was a whole reason it was sold at that price. Uh, so we wound up renting out the property for a couple of years. And, and and we were more than covering the mortgage payment, uh, more than covering the property management fees. But you know, being in grad school with no other source of income, the last thing in the world I wanted was a six month vacancy and having to cover the mortgage. Um, so we wound up selling it and didn't get back into real estate until two thousand four. So probably another four years after that. Uh, and, and then, and this was the article that I wrote about uh, the the first guest post I did for you on bigger pockets was uh, we started doing real estate development because we, we were friends with a builder. And so we kind of went in on a deal with him where we'd buy the lot, we'd fund the construction loan and he would do the building. And the first one was great. We made uh, probably a hundred percent cash on cash off of our investments. So we thought, Hey, we can do this again. We bought a second property um, and it was going along fine. And we needed to keep the we need to keep the uh, the crew together, and so we wound up buying more properties, and we got overextended, and, and so that slowed down the real estate again until we could get rid of all those properties. So, so I will I'll link to that that article because that was a really good one that you wrote, uh, and I'll I'll put that in the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show fifty three. But for those who haven't read the article, can you kind of explain? I mean, what exactly were you doing with with those properties? Yeah, so um, we were doing spec home. Um, uh, it was in a it was in a resort, a ski resort. Uh, we had bought a lot. We had the builder go build a, a pretty nice second home for skiers. Uh, the first one we sold before we even broke ground. So we, we had it listed. We had the uh, the architectural drawings. We had the you know the CAD CAM view of what it looked like, and it sold right away. And we thought, holy cow, Pater! Um, <laughs> the the first mistake that we made though was 
not somehow tying any changes and modifications that the people wanted to uh, the price that they were paying. So they, they paid the same price, and we wound up getting stuck with the mortgage for six months while they're doing modifications. Um, but you know, we still wound up with that about 100% cash on cash return. Uh, we bought a second lot. We were going to do the same thing. Uh, we wanted to keep the crew together, so we bought a couple of other lots thinking, hey, we can flip this just as quickly. Uh, and it didn't happen that way. Uh, that was 2006, and the market for uh, particularly vacation homes just fell through the floor, and we wound up... Uh, we still made a profit on the second one, but by the time that had rolled around, we realized we were, you know, we were in danger of going under if we actually built on the next two lots. So we just sold the lots, and it took a long time to get rid of it. Gotcha, gotcha. I, I, I just want to step back really quick to that first property that you bought because you said something that I actually want to repeat here, I, I, and I think it's super, super important that we emphasize. You know, you bought this VA home. And you slapped a coat of paint on, did a did a little touch up, and thought you were gonna, you know, yield uh, nice profits on the deal, and you know, so essentially you didn't do anything. You bought it and said, "Hey, I'm gonna just buy it and resell it and and make a killing," right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know that was that was the whole thing that these infomercials led you to believe. Yeah, was hey, I can I can if I find the right property and I buy it at the right price, then I can just through the magic of wishful thinking, somehow mark it up some significant amount and make a profit off of it. And the thing was, I wasn't creating value. And that's where you make money in real estate. You either, you either buy because someone's in a distressed situation and you have insider knowledge about that distress situation, or you've got to add value. Yeah. There's no other way to really make money. Yeah, perfect. Me, or at least in my experience, there's no other way to make money. No, I, th- I think I agree, and, and I, think, uh, I don't think I could have put it any better. So thank you for saving me the breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's interesting. Uh, I went through kind of the same thing with my first, uh, I guess you could say my second. My first flip was before the market crash. My second one was during the market crash. As I was watching all those flipping TV shows, and they were you know so exciting and watching people make $100,000 on you know, throwing some paint and carpet into a place. So yeah, I, I, I flipped. I got excited by the, by the TV shows too. And in, in the same way that you ended up with a rental because of it, I ended up with a rental because of it. And it was, it cash flowed every month. It's great. I still own it today, but it was, so it's funny how like in an indirect way, those TV shows or the gurus in your case, like they still led us to the place where we should have been all along, but they led us there in a very roundabout, uh, painful way, maybe. (laughs) So. Well, and, and it's okay if, if you're a flipper and you've got the skills and you know how to redo a kitchen better than someone else or do it for cheaper or whatever, that's fine. But have a backup plan. And, and I, I didn't have a backup plan. The backup plan was, oh, crap. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I'm, now in, I'm now in grad school. Holy cow, what do I do? Um, and, and I had no income. That was yeah. the other thing. I, I was in grad school. I had no income except for my summer internships. Uh, and that certainly wouldn't have been enough to cover a mortgage. Yep. All right. So, so what kind of real estate investing are you doing today? Uh, so, so I invest in single property or single family homes. Um, our portfolio right now is seven single family homes and one condo. The condo is, is where the unintentional landlords, it was the place that we lived in. We moved, we couldn't sell it. So we rented it out to cover the cash flow. Nice. Um, I, I primarily rent in single family homes. Um, you know, if a duplex or a quad came up and the numbers were right, I would do it. But uh, for me, I feel like where we live um, and the kind of the network I have in place and the understanding of the market, I have an informational advantage by investing in single family homes versus something else. You know, I, I, and I've been approached for commercial properties and, and I just don't know that market. And I, I refuse to invest in a market I don't know about where I don't have some sort of informational advantage. And, and you know, you, we were talking earlier about the um, about people who watch, you know, the the HGTV, the real estate flippers shows, whatever, um, and, and they think that they can do it. Or you know, you invested, you bought, you flipped in a rising market. Um, there's something called attributional bias, which basically says if something good happens, you attribute it to yourself. If something bad happens, you attribute it to external factors. Yep. Um, and that happens, it happens in the stock market and it, it happens in real estate investing. So for the stock market, you know, if, if you happen to invest in Google at the IPO and it went up and now you think, oh, I'm this great investor, it, it, it may just be that the market 
rose in general. I mean, the S&P 500 was up you know, 23% last year. You could just have caught the rising tide and may not have the skills that you think that you have. So it's really important to be able to separate out what are my skills versus what was the market giving me. Is that, you know, I think that's kind of similar to how I go to the restroom every time my team is losing and then they turn it around. <laughs> yep. Precision. Yeah. Well, it's like in, the, Mark Cuban has a quote that said, in a bull market, everyone is a genius. It's kind of the same yeah. thing, right? Yes. You feel exactly. like- it, it, it's the same in a, in a rising housing market. And, you know, it wasn't until 2008 that we suddenly found ourselves with our pants down. And, and you know, I'm sure, I'm sure some of our, you know, just like the backup plan was oak crap, now we have our pants down. Yeah, there you um, go. <laughs> well, our pants were down when we had the oak crap. <laughs> I, I feel like that's where all the, the, the gurus, like a lot of them tend to come from is they were the geniuses in a bull market. And so they then put out, you know, all this, uh, I, I'm a professional. I know everything in the world there is to do. And, you know, I really hope that's what sets apart bigger pockets from everyone else. Like I really hope that it, more than almost anything else is that Josh and I never like, even though we're hosting this podcast, we never claim to really like know what we're doing i mean like we like we 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 have our experiences and we have what's worked for us and what doesn't work for us but like i mean none of our guests nobody ever claims to be like the expert at knowing what we're doing here and uh i like to think that's what sets things apart so well i think i think that's a good point because you know i mean we've had some some folks who are you know beyond i mean more experienced than the three of us uh you know multiply 10 times over and yet they still will talk about the fact that they're just figuring things out. So yeah. mm-hmm. like last know. week we asked Ken McElroy, you know, what are some of the mistakes you made? His answer was, are we talking about just today? Like that was perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like yep. I, I love that when, I mean like, yeah, we don't have it all figured out at all. And I hope the people listening to the show know that. I mean, we talk about numbers and properties we buy in, but you know, this is a, this is a game that we're all playing and we're all playing it together. And I think that's what makes it exciting. Well, and, and in real estate investing or just investing in general, the idea is that you want to take multiple cracks at something that has a reasonable chance of doing well. So that if, if one of them does great, great. If one of them flails, then that's okay too. You know, it, it hurts a little, but it, it's not going to sink you. Um, you know, the, the people, and, and to me, this is the hardest thing to, to think about is when you're getting in, it's hard to diversify. You know, you, you got to take that one crack. It's going to take a significant amount of capital or a significant amount of risk. And it pretty much has to work if you want to keep rolling it. Uh, otherwise, you got to be patient and you got to wait and you got to accumulate enough capital to where you, know, you can have 8, 10, and 12 properties so that you diversify your risk away. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, you know, you bring up something interesting that I didn't really put a ton of thought into until now. Uh, a lot of people come out, they try it, and they expect to succeed. And, you know, a lot of them fail. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're not always going to get a hit on, on your first shot. And, and, you know, what really does set people apart who, who are going to be successful and make it are the people who say, okay, you know what, just because I met, didn't have a great deal on this first deal doesn't mean that this isn't a good place for me to make money. You know, that would be like saying buying some stock and losing a little bit and then saying, well, I'm done with stock, stock suck. You know, it just, you know, and and you see that a lot. You do. And you hear it a lot. And, and, you know, uh, we we see it a lot in in real estate. And I guess, you know, I guess I kind of want to encourage newer investors, you know, if if they didn't do as well on that first deal that they thought they were going to do, you know, Give it, give it another shot. You know, don't just quit. Don't just give up after that first try because you never know what's going to come next, and and you're going to get better. You know, uh, you know, the, the, the past is going to educate you, hopefully, and and you won't make the same mistakes. And uh, Eddie Johnson, who's on the U.S. national soccer team, I, I just heard an interview with him. And he had a great quote, even the quotation, even though it doesn't apply necessarily to what we're talking about, uh, is or, or you know, he wasn't talking about real estate investing. He was talking about soccer. Um, and he said, you don't fail if you don't make it. You fail if you don't make it and you give up. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're a first time investor and it, it's two things. One, again, make sure that you've got that contingency plan. Hey, if I can't flip this, can I rent it? If I can't rent it at the price I want, what's the price that I need? Um, you know, what are the things I can do to, to salvage a deal? Um, and then secondly, if it doesn't work out, make sure that you've got 
some sort of process review? Did you make a mistake somewhere along the way? Have a mentor or someone who's experienced in real estate investing or a wise agent, not just a brand new green behind the ears real estate agent who's just trying to get a 3% commission, someone who's actually helped people walk through investment deals and ask, hey, where are the steps? Where could I have improved? And if your process is good, yeah, sometimes it's luck. And it's just like investing. You know, if you have a good process, then as long as you're doing and sticking to your investment theses and everything is okay, you know, sometimes there's going to be luck and yeah. you just can't dodge luck. And, and, and you have to expose yourself to the upside of luck too. You know, if you, if you bought and bought and bought in 2008, 2009, 2010, probably by 2015, 2017, you're going to look like a genius. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. True. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Well, so though you, you started with that one property. You did a few of these uh, spec builds. What what came next? I mean, obviously, you said you know you've got a couple of properties now. You got seven seven properties, seven uh, single families in the condo. Uh, what uh, what kind of came in between? Uh, so I uh, started my own software development company um, and ran that for seven and a half years, um, and actually sold it, and so started hey. having some. Some significant cash flow out of that. Um, and so we wanted to get back into real estate investing. Um, we knew it was a good long-term kind of steady, uh, steady growth vehicle, um, not just for the income, but a little bit of capital appreciation, although we don't buy um, expecting capital appreciation. Anything that comes is gravy. As far as we're concerned, we buy it for the income yeah. and have to make the numbers kind of look right. Uh, we, we've yet to hit, hit my ideal, uh, which is that bigger pockets, 10% uh, cash on cash return. Um, haven't, haven't quite gotten there. We're at about 8.7%. Um, so that's what we started doing with, our, with, our, um, with the sale proceeds was, was acquiring these single family homes. We had decided uh, back in 2007 that we wanted to move to Fort Worth. Um, and so we actually bought a foreclosure back then, and that was our first investment property. And then as we started getting the funds from the, the sale of the company, we just every time we get a little bit of money, we'd call up our property manager and say, hey, we're ready for another one. And we gave her kind of our parameters, which are the bigger pockets guidelines, and uh, she goes hunting for us. And w- so, so what are those? Sorry. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Okay, yeah, what, right. what are those guidelines? What do you, yeah. what do you mean? So... Um, it's two sets of guidelines that, that we live by. One is the assumption that you can only spend 50% of the income that you make and that you set aside 50% for the expenses. Um, we, don't, we don't use leverage, so we buy all cash. Um, so you know, for us, that's, it's 50% profit or cash flow to our bottom line. Um, and then the other one is that we are trying to get a 10% cash on cash return annually Based on the purchase price. Now, you know, we haven't we haven't gotten there. We're usually in the eights, um, but for us, <clears throat> because of our plan, so we want to get to financial ind- So we're financially independent. We want to get to what I call pyre passive income, retire early, which is you can retire your expenses are covered by fifty percent of your rental income, plus a little bit of margin, um, not accounting for depreciation. Um, so we wanted to get there as quickly as possible. So we were willing to trade buying the properties now to accelerate the timeline rather than waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the incremental 1%. Let, let's touch on that again. That You just said pyre and you said that was passive. That income. sounds good to me. I like yeah, this whole pyre concept. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, what, what was it again you said? And then let's, let's I guess, dwell on that. Yeah, a so bit. It's, it's, it's passive income, retire early. Um, so, you know, there's the whole fire, financially independent, retire early. Um, and fire is based on can, effectively can I take 4% of my assets every year and live off of those. Um, so based on Bill Bingen's safe max withdrawal rate. Um, I like to go one a little bit further, which is I don't want to be actively managing withdrawing from my stock, I don't have a stock portfolio, but a mutual fund portfolio every month or every year for living expenses. I'd rather just have checks come in. Um, and so 
for us, we are using uh, our rental property portfolio to create that stream of passive income that will help us bridge early retirement all the way through until Social Security when we'll slowly start uh, selling our properties and converting it back into, into assets. Because, you know, I, as a 60-something-year-old, I don't want to be calling my property manager every month and, you know, having those, oh, well, what should I invest in next? I, I, I just don't want to fool with that one well, that age. And my property manager is going to be that age. She's probably going to be retiring. So I have that risk. Um, so to me, that is almost the ultimate. So if you had a pension, it'd be the same way. Uh, if you had annuities, it'd be the same thing. For me, rental properties are kind of like a stream of annuity payments. And, and so I want to be lazy when I retire. That's a great way of putting it. It yeah. really is. I, and, and I think, uh, I think the, the, the people who get it obviously see it in, in the same light. And, and you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of I'm I'm the guy who focuses on cash flow as well. I'm I'm not a big appreciation guy. I mean, I think get it where you can. Uh, you know, if you're building or or buying in an area of growth, then you're still buying. Well, at least in my book, you still go for the cash flow. But then all of a sudden, you know, you'll you'll get the appreciation bonus, right? Yep. Um, yep. So that's great. Well, why? But, you know, I, what I don't want to do is depend on this appreciation. Right. Get to age sixty-five. Find out it's not there. And then have yet another oh crap moment where I'm going to have to suddenly go back into the job market after having been out for twenty something years. Well, uh, no, heck with that. Why no? Why no leverage? How how come you're buying, buying all cash? Why don't you buy all cash and then uh, do a refi, take take cash out, and use that to expand the portfolio? You know, uh, I I looked at that, um, and for us, it, it doesn't really it doesn't accelerate the timeline any. So the leverage doesn't really get us into any into a position of of pyre any quicker. So somewhere between two and three years from now, we will achieve pyre based on what we're buying and what we see coming in. Um, leverage doesn't it doesn't move the needle any in, in terms of achieving pyre. Um, and and yes, while we've got we've got the assets to where we feel like you know, the the cash flow would be there, we can back it up. It's a very very low risk proposition. It doesn't get us incrementally more properties that cash flow incrementally more. So, I mean, I've evaluated it. it, it if I had a 10-year time frame, then based on, and based on where I am now and having enough cash flow from my rental property portfolio to support leverage, I, I would do it. So that's just based on, it's just based on the timeline. Yeah, it's solely based on the timeline. And, and that is the one exception to to the no debt good debt rule that I have is if you have enough cash flow from your rental properties, I know this is all mental accounting. I mean, you could have income from your job or from other things too, but I just like to keep it clean mentally. If you have the cash flow from the income properties to more than cover a long-term vacancy in your leveraged property, and for me, that was two to one. So I had to have two properties that were cash flowing to cover one leveraged property in order for that to work out, then I'm fine with that. I really don't have any heartburn about that. But for most people, they overlever. I've been there, you know, I've I've been overlevered. I've had the the lots that were that were mortgaged and having to write the mortgage check every single month for five years while waiting for the daggum things to sell. It sucks. And I don't want to be in that position. Yeah. yeah. It it makes sense because you like you said, your timeline's maybe two, three years for this. Like I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you for return on investment, you could probably achieve the ten percent that you you're wanting if you leverage. I mean, that shouldn't be difficult at all. Yes. But yes. does does that two percent difference make a difference on a two to three year time frame? Probably not. Not enough to to sacrifice that risk. So again, it just comes it's, it's back like to people, it's it's like the people that um that optimize that completely optimize for having no income tax and then wind up spending part of that money. Yeah. Like, oh well, I can get two percent. You can't get two percent, but you know, I can get two tenths of a percent in a money market fund. But because the money's there, they wind up spending it and they defeat the purpose. So yeah. you know, it's it's that same thing. Is is does the leverage really move the needle for your long term goals? I mean, if you're trying to if you're trying to accumulate a, a portfolio of thirty properties and you've got ten already, and you want to lever up three, four, five, that, that's probably fine. And then as those get paid off. You know, you use the cash flow from the other ten to pay off the debt on the three, four, five that you've got, and then lather rents repeat. I, I'm I'm fine with that. 
Yeah. Well, it reminds me, uh, we asked a question on Facebook a couple weeks ago, uh, and it got a ton, a ton of comments. I think we're over 100 comments now. And I basically asked, if you had uh, $100,000, would you put it towards you know, a $20,000 down payment on five different properties? Would you buy a $100,000 property all cash? Or would you put that $100,000 as a 20% down payment on like a five hundred thousand dollar apartment complex, and uh, so like if you had a hundred grand, there's a lot of different options you have based on leverage, right? That that was a fascinating, fascinating Facebook, I mean, discussion yeah. because it's so different. I mean, every person argued a different point. I mean, like yeah, well over a hundred comments on that Facebook thing, and uh, I mean, I encourage people go check it out. Go facebookcom slash pockets. I'll tell you what we do, yeah. which is we buy two fifty thousand dollar properties. You know, you diversify your risk a little. I found that um, I it, the there's a there's a break even point of course, but you know where I am, um, I will get more of a return on cash from two fifty thousand dollar properties than I will off of one one hundred thousand dollar property. And yeah. I mean, we just experienced this. So we uh, we lived outside of Fort Worth up until about three months ago, and we had a we had a a three two and a half you know typical starter home starter community. Uh, we sold it, and we we are parlaying that into effectively two rental properties. And we could have we could have rented the property out that we had lived in, and probably gotten eleven hundred dollars in rent, or we parlayed it into two rental properties that each got nine hundred dollars in rent. Mm-hmm. So where we are, it makes more sense to buy two of the smaller properties, um, and then. You know, if if you want to then use those two and lever up and buy another fifty thousand dollar property, go for it. Yeah. And then let the cash flow pay those off and just keep rolling. Because I I I know mathematically leverage is the right answer. I mean, I, I know that. And I'm I'm cool with the mathematics. But all those people who have either hocked their credit cards to, you know, put a down payment on that first flip property or, <laughs> um, or, put uh, a down or whatever, you know what it's like to go to bed at night going, Oh my God, what if I don't get through the eye of this needle? I am screwed. I've, and, and I've been there 50 times in the last 10 years. I mean, over and over where you and, lay in bed at three. Probably, yeah. It, you probably eliminated a couple of years out of your life for it. Probably, you know? I think it, it, you make a really it's good stress. point. But yeah, it's 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 um. It, it, and you know, if you're young, if you're twenty something, and you you've got a you you've got a, a useful degree, <clears throat> you've got good job a good job and good job prospects, and you're employable. You know, I mean, if you're a civil engineer, you're generally employable versus a, an arts major or something. Um, and, and you know, if something bad happens. Happens, you've kind of got that backup of your income to be able to cover it, and you want to take the risk. Fine, you know, as long as you make an informed decision and you know what you're going to do if if things don't work out, great. But don't go crazy and overlever yourself. I mean, I would not do the five properties at twenty percent each. Not it, it, even though you're diversified. Theoretically, you're diversified, but now you've got five times the mortgage payments and if something if. If the worst case scenario happens, you're going bankrupt, and that's something I think you can you can avoid. You can lever smart without risking bankruptcy. Well, and yeah. and not just the five times the mortgage payments, but you also have five amount of phone calls from the property manager, and you have five times the insurance documents that are being sent to your house every day because something's wrong. Like just ad- admin administrative stuff is the more properties you get. People don't think of that. I, I think we think in terms of math and numbers. But there's a lot of admin stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, my, my wife spends probably 30, 40 hours a week just doing admin stuff on our properties. Yeah. It's, it's horrendous. And, and, and I use a property manager. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, 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 you go, if you lever five, then you can't afford the property manager. You're, you're out managing that property yourself. Yeah. And you know, it depends on how you value your time. Um, but I value my time a little bit more. And so I'm willing to hire the property manager because – I, the only time I hear anything is like one of our tenants died in the house, <laughs> nice. um, which, you know, was, it's a terrible situation. It was at Christmas. It was Ooh. on his daughter's birthday. I mean, oh. it was all sorts of sad. Um, but, and, and so, you know, obviously we help out in those situations, but otherwise I, I don't hear anything except for, Hey, you know, your, your tenant in this property lost a job. He moved. I've already got it rented out. 
or the hot wire here went, and here's how much it's going to cost, and here's the bill, and it's already taken care of. Sounds like you have a good property manager. I have an awesome property manager. Well, can we can we talk about that because you, you oh. know it, the, the world is easy when you have an awesome property manager, and and when you're in a, a situation where you don't, it sucks. Because I've been there, and and uh, it's absolutely atrocious, and and you know you're you're up. Just as much, if not more, than the guy who's got you know all his money on credit cards. Uh, so, so yeah. h- how did you come about to find your property manager, and and really what makes them a good property manager? Um, so she is um, she is a second generation property manager. Um, her mother had the real estate firm and then did the property management and then the mother just wanted to do the real estate. And so she handed off the property management portfolio to the daughter. Um, So we interviewed a couple of potential property managers when we first bought and uh, she actually came out at the lowest price, not percentage wise, but at the lowest rent. She said, Hey, you know, I could, we could try and rent out for 1200 bucks and it might sit vacant for six months. But I know if I rent out a thousand, it will get rented as opposed to every other property mm. manager that was saying 1200, 1200. That's 1, great. That's great. Yeah. And I would rather it be rented because it doesn't take very long for that opportunity cost to make it a bad decision. You know, it only has to be vacant for three months before that's a poor decision. Um, and so, you know, that we obviously interviewed her more than that. Um, she's the president of the local chamber of commerce. So she's really tied in. To the community. She's very active in the community. She's part of the Lions Club. She's part of the Rotary. So I think because everyone knows who she is and, and she, she doesn't advertise, she's got this little dinky office you can drive right by. It's literally on the other side of the tracks. Um, you could totally miss it, but she's very, very involved in the community. She's got kids that are active in sports. Um, so everyone knows who she is. And so anytime someone has a problem, Either, hey, I've got this property that I need to get rid of, or I need to go live somewhere. Who do they turn to? They turn to her because she is so well connected in the community. And it's a little small community, probably 13,000 people. But she's, aside from the mayor, she's probably the most well known person in the community. And That's that awesome. is an enormous asset. Yeah. Um, you know, that is worth its weight in gold. I have not haggled with her over any pricing because. I, what the last thing in the world I want her to do is start treating me as anything but her number one client. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's great. And and the the other, you know, what were the other uh, attributes about her that made you choose her above and beyond the the uh, other folks you interviewed uh, when when you first started meeting her? I, I I think it was because she had a reasonable portfolio size. So when we first started using her, she probably had 80, 85 properties under okay. management. She's now probably got 110. Um, you know, so she's not, she's guy enough to where she does it. She's got that network of, um, you know, the painter and the roofer and, and the handyman and all that good stuff so that, so that you don't get hosed on pricing. Um, but she doesn't have 500 properties to where you're just a drop of water in the ocean and, and she's overwhelmed and she can't service everyone. Um, and she had a waiting list. She was like, I've already got people that I, I can just give them a call and I can put them in here. I got a waiting list, 10 people deep of, of people that are ready to go. Um, and so between that and her connection with her mother, you know, her mother was the realtor. Her mother had the deal flow. Now she's got the deal flow. So other investors that want to get rid of their properties or, you know, someone hears of something somewhere with someone doing something because she's always at the games or talking to people or whatnot. Um, I think all that kind of together really made it worthwhile. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, your, your point about pricing is is one that I think most people probably wouldn't even think about up front. But, you know, as an investor, not on the rental side, but on the on the sales side, you know, if I go and I interview, uh, you know, a bunch of real estate agents to sell my house, the one who comes at the top price is definitely not the one that I'm looking at right away. You know, because yeah. you know you're 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 taking a risk the higher you go above the median price there of yeah. of these folks that you're interviewing, and and I, I'd say the same is 
potentially true on on the rental side. You know, it, what you know, if if yep. everybody's saying rent is somewhere between here and here, and somebody says, you know, you're probably going to mitigate your your time loss by by dropping it X percent, and you know, frankly, over time we could always raise it and get it up to to the next point. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it might not be a bad strategy to get the ball moving. Yeah, and and I'm willing to do a dangle, you know, to say, okay, well, we'll try and rent this property at twelve hundred and fifty dollars a month. Let's leave it out there for a couple of weeks. If if you don't get any bites, we'll drop the price. Um, you know, I'm I'm okay with taking an aggressive approach, but making it time bounded. Yeah, as opposed to you know, I'm going to wait until I get twelve hundred and fifty dollars, Dad Gummit. <laughs> because then you may be waiting for months, and, and that's that's money that's not coming into your pockets. It's not expense. It's not a check that you're writing, but it's still lost money. I mean, look, the bottom line on a rental property is this. If you're not renting the unit, there's two reasons for it. It's overpriced or the place looks like crap. I mean, really, yep. there's there's nothing else to it, you know? Yep. Uh, so... You know, people ask all the time on the forums, and you know, well, I can't get tenants. Well, what do I do? Drop your price. Yep. yep. Uh, there's a art- there's an article I wrote on the blog a few weeks ago called "The Two Most Painful Words a Landlord Will Ever Hear," and the words were "I'm moving." Because vacancy mm-hmm. is the worst. I mean, that is the highest expense probably that anybody pays over the course. I mean, yeah, like you know, yeah, you know, eviction is going to cost you with damages five grand. But over the course of all your properties, vacancy is always going to be probably your highest expense. And Absolutely, and she's she's delivering eight <laughs> percent off uh, over our portfolio of properties, um, and has us in some long term leases. So I actually expect that that number over time will go down and. To me, you know, so based on the bigger pockets numbers, they assume a sixteen percent vacancy rate. Well, she's making eight percent. I'm paying her ten. Really, I'm only paying her two percent based on kind of your your averages of vacancy rates. It's a good way so of looking at it. She's yeah. more than worth it. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Uh, she she's totally making up the money. All right, so Jason, you are a financial planner. Uh, that is what yes. you do for a career. So it would be a shame not to yes. touch on that kind of aspect of <laughs> of your life and how that affects your investing. So first of all, let, let's for those who don't know, what does a financial planner even do? So my job, as I see it, is to first and foremost help you figure out what's important to you in your life and what your goals are. And uh, then and only then do I start talking money. Um, and the first thing I do is make sure that you've got a safety net for everything bad that could happen to you. And then and only then do we talk about how much you're spending and how much you're earning. And only after that do we talk about how to invest. So for whatever reason, and probably because this is what you know, all the strip mall financial advisors do, and this is what they show on TV and their CNBC and all this, everyone seems to think that the financial planning equals investment advice. And while I am a registered investment advisor, which means that the SEC believes I can offer investment advice, it's only 20% of the overall picture. I think 80% of it is really figuring out your life, aligning your goals, aligning your actions towards it, and aligning your spending against what's important in your life. Um, and then making sure that, you know, if you step out in front of the beer truck tomorrow and either get killed or get maimed, that you aren't in some horrible Medicaid nursing home as a result of it. Yeah. Um, and so to me, that's the important stuff. Can you, and, you know, uh, was it, was it you want to be when you, when you grow up, what do you want to do when you retire? When do you want to retire? And is that realistic? And then we start talking about how do you invest to make that happen? Hey, so my wife is going to be at a, at a restaurant in town next week. You know, can you accidentally bump into her and and talk to her about our spending? <laughs> I love you, honey. No. Well, I think that's a conversation the two of you need to have. No, you know, I, I, and, and you know, the funny thing is, no, I bring it. I um, you know, and it's well, not, half of what I do is is marriage count. Well, that's what I was going to say, and that's not. You know, the, Ironically, it's actually not an issue for for us, but I but I do bring it up because I think it is an issue for most people. Yeah. I I think most where most people fail is in their ability to communicate with one another about their spending habits. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. I, uh, uh, there's another podcast on another place that's not nearly as cool as Bigger Pockets, where <laughs> I talk about advice for newlywed couples. 
Um, and you know, 52, 53% of divorces are caused by money problems. And to me, money problems is a euphemism for poor communication. Yeah. And you know, you can have, you can be tight on money and not have money problems. You can have a lot of income and have money problems. And it's because you're not communicating. You haven't, you haven't sat down and really built the relationship with your spouse that you agree on what's important and that you're both going in the same direction. And to me, you know, when people say, oh, it's his money or it's her money or he earns this, I earn that, that's a, that's a red flag. You're yeah. not communicating. It's we. You know, you made those vows that said two shall be joined as one. And if you are thinking as one, then you have communication problems and you have marriage problems. And that's not something that a financial planner is going to magically make disappear overnight. You've got to do something else um, with regard to improving your communication so that you can get your goals in place, so that you have a plan and you execute on the plan. And then it's not a money problem. It is we you know, maybe we don't earn the money that we want and here are the steps that we're taking to improve it or we spend too much in certain areas and here are the things that we're doing to reduce our spending. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's great. And I, and I think you're right. I mean, a, a vast majority of the people that I know who have gotten divorced, uh, it was, it was uh, completely due to financial issues and, and it could have been predicted up front easily if, if uh, you know, these guys had communicated. Do you ad- and the sad thing is, the, in in premarital counseling, you know, you you get a you get a preacher, a pastor, a, a priest, a, a shaman, whatever, who doesn't really know about yeah, yeah rabbi. I'm I'm sorry, yeah, <laughs> rabbi. Um, uh, well, having not gone through Jewish premarital counseling, <laughs> but they're but they're people with a cloth, so to speak. And, you know, they, they probably don't earn a lot. They, they don't spend a lot. They haven't really been exposed to a lot of money problems. So they glossed over it in the, in the premarital counseling. I mean, I remember mine was, do you have money problems? It's like, well, you know, we've got credit card debt, but we know about it and we're, we're addressing it. Okay. And then on to the next thing. You know, he wanted to talk about more about sex and where you're going to live and this, that, and the other than the money part. And it was, you know, that quick in the money part. So uh, there's got to be something else you've. You, Got to really work on it before you get married, when you get married, and during the marriage to have that communication. And 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 just to clarify, you you said your preacher wanted to talk to you about sex. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I, just, I, I think I think in my premarital counseling, I think we had that discussion as well. <laughs> A little awkward, but <laughs> we're living in <laughs> <laughs> Well, go, uh, so go. I'm I'm wondering then, do you advise against couples? from having separate checking accounts or is that a different issue? Cause I know some people like Dave Ramsey, you know, he's very against that. So what are your thoughts? Uh, for most of your expenses, um, you do keep a joint checking account. We keep separate individual checking accounts for our, um, uh, I call it blow fund, which is, you know, you're, you're as long as it's not illegal, immoral or unethical, I don't care what you spend the money on. Okay. Um, so we each set aside a little bit of money each month that, you know, if she wants to go buy Jimmy Choo shoes, great. If I want to go buy something for the man cave, great. No questions asked. As long as there aren't police knocking on the door or there's going to be some sort of lawsuit that comes as a result of the purchase, we don't care. Um, but we do have a joint account for our regular expenses. And you may want to rename the blow fund to something other than the cocaine fund. <laughs> Now you know why I spend my money on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so here, here's here's a question. Um, how how does somebody find a financial planner who isn't just about you know, hey, you know, you got to pick this stock, you got to pick that stock. You know, you, you know, you want somebody who's going to help you with the budgeting. You want somebody who's going to talk about your death. You know, you want somebody who's going to talk about life insurance and wills and trusts and and help with that above and beyond all the other, you know, stocks and bonds and real estate. Right. Right. Um, so I'm biased because I am one, but, um, I believe you should pay, a, uh, a, a fee only financial planner. Uh, that's the actual term that we use. Uh, someone who will either charge you a flat fee or by the hour that is not going to sell you a product that is not going to try and sell you, uh, front-loaded mutual funds, anything like that. Um, and, and I also, 
aside from cases where people don't have the mental wherewithal. So for, for example, if you're 75 years old, you probably want someone to manage your money for you because you're more susceptible to making cognitive errors, particularly mathematical errors, than a 25-year-old is going mm-hmm. to be. Um, but in most cases, if you're, if you're young enough and you're savvy enough and you, know, you, you got your head straight, you don't need someone to manage your money for you. And uh, they're going to charge 1% of your assets that they manage for that quote unquote privilege, and it's usually to underperform the market. Um, and, and, and there to me is kind of a conflict of interest because yeah. let's, let's say you're a bigger pockets listener and you go to a financial planner who does assets under management. Well, his incentive is to get as much of your net worth under his management as possible. So he's going to tell you, sell your real estate portfolio and give it all to me and let me manage it. Um, which is which is why I think having someone who doesn't manage money, who uh, the the other part is that they have to have a fiduciary duty. So if you're a CFP, you have to have the fiduciary duty. If you're a registered investment advisor, you have to have the fiduciary duty. And what that means is that I'm going to put my client's best interest first and not my own. Yeah. Whereas if you, if you get a salesperson, they don't have that legally binding fiduciary duty, and there's a uh, there's a psychological bias that if you trust me, I, I can screw you over and you're not going to care. Yeah, it, it it actually has been shown and proven over and over again through blind trials that if I can get you to trust me, I can screw you over and you're not going to care. Well, you know, how many people think, oh, Bernie Madoff, he was a good guy. He was fun to hang out with at the country club. Sure, he took $10 million from me, but he was fun to go drink him with. Yeah, same yeah. idea. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and not that, and not that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Financial players are not out to screw you. Don't, don't. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that, but there is an underlying subconscious conflict of interest when you have someone who is who is paid based on how much of something he can do for you, and yeah. and, and and an hourly planner is going to have a conflict of interest too because they're going to get paid more the more they work for you. So. Yeah. It's up to you to say, hey, I'm going to bound. Here's what I want. And I don't want more than I usually say it's 10 to six, 12 to 16 hours. You know, if someone wants more than 16 hours worth of work, then you've got to have a pretty special case. You have to have a special needs child. You have to have a very high level of net worth. You know, there has to be something that differentiates you from 80 to 90% of the people that are out there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, well, so what are what are fees? I mean, I'm not asking for yours, no. but kind of you know. An oh, mine's 150 an hour. 150 it's, an hour. It's on okay. my, yeah, it's on my form ADV. It's on my website. I got nothing to hide. Is that is um, that typical? Is that high end, mid end, low end? Where does I, that? Fall? I think it's I think it's going to be average for okay. the industry. Um, you know, I've got uh, I I'm I'm what's called a CFP certificate, so I passed the CFP exam. I've only been a financial planner for a year and a half, but I also built and sold a company a multi-million dollar company and I'm financially independent. So I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. So I've got the, I kind of have the credentials um, as well as an MBA from a top 10 school, even though that doesn't guarantee I know crap about personal finance. It does know I know numbers. Um, And I have my own rental property portfolio. So, you know, I I can again speak from a position of having done it. Um, So fees generally for me would be 1800 to 24 hundred dollars um higher end you would go five thousand uh if you just want to check up it might cost 500 bucks yeah gotcha all right so so you know that that brings us to to the next thing that i think is really important about financial planning um and and i think it's the fact that most financial planners don't talk about real estate at least at least the commission guys because again it's not in their interest um and rarely rarely i mean you know, look at look at the uh, you know you look at any of the financial magazines. You know, most of them look at real estate as an aside. CNBC, you know, they'll talk about real estate at a macro level, but they're yeah. never going to dig in. You know, you know uh, Fox right. Business or Wall Street, nobody yep. really covers it. And and mm-hmm. you know, we do bigger pockets, and you know, we, we, I think right. we do a fun, uh, fantastic job of it. But you know, why the heck are the people who are responsible for educating us about the world of money and not talking about real estate. 
Well, it, it, it goes back to the, uh, to the incentives. I mean, if you think about it, if, if I can get you into a REIT or into some sort of REIT mutual fund that I'm going to get 1% of out, out of every transaction, then that's where I'm going to put you. And it's a whole lot easier to say, well, just go into this REIT than to, than to educate someone on what it takes to be a successful real estate investor. Um, and and I, honestly, I think, I, you know, I can't say this with certainty, but I imagine a lot of financial planners eat their dog food. And so if they're saying, hey, invest in ABC mutual fund, they're invested in ABC mutual fund. Um, so they don't have the experience. They haven't, they haven't done it. They, they view it as an asset class in, in a macro sense. And you know, we all know that the real estate is very, very local. And you know, what works in Fort Worth, Texas doesn't work in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, so it takes um, a lot of, it, it takes some general knowledge, you know, the, the bigger pockets rules. Heck, that's pretty much, I, I tell clients who are interested in investing in real estate, here are the bigger pockets rules. Here's the links. Go read. Get smart. Don't don't pay me $150 an hour to regurgitate what you can go read. Yeah. Um, so really, all I do is is validate. Hey, if you want to do real estate investing, and, and you know this is your approach, then this is how you think about it, and that's where you go get smart. And then if you want me to validate your numbers and your models, sure. Yeah. You know that's seventy five bucks or one hundred and fifty to validate your models versus however many hundreds or thousands it's going to take for me to teach you what I know, which is you know basically what you guys do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and how about balance? You know, real estate yep. investors, they, yep. they tend to be all or nothing, hundred percent real estate and, and nothing, yep. nothing else. They, you know, they don't want to be in the market. They don't want to deal with it. And non-investors, non-real estate investors, you know, they, they typically don't touch it. They don't mess around with yep. it. So where, where is the balance and, and, um, you know, should there be, I, I mean, frankly, I think there should be, uh, some kind of balance uh, between it and how do you kind of manage it then? Uh, so there, there should be a balance, but it may not be 50 50. Right. So if, if you are a seasoned real estate investor and you can eye a deal and you can find a deal and you can, you can swing a deal and you're going to make 10, 12, 15% and you know it, and, and you know, you have enough experience that you know what you're going to get, then why would you invest in something that's not in your wheelhouse? So, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of investing in what you know. You know, I'm an entrepreneur, so I invest in small business. Um, and, and real estate is kind of that secondary area of my expertise. Um, but, you know, we still, we fund our IRAs fully. Um, my wife has a SEP, 401k. We will, we will invest in those and those go into the stock market. And they go into mutual funds and they're boring old index funds because I'm too stupid to figure out what the market's going to do tomorrow, <laughs> and so are ninety nine point nine percent of investors. That's not true. That's not true, <laughs> Jason. You are you are you are far smarter than really stupid. <laughs> so I'm marginally stupid. <laughs> so, but you know, even and and even let's just let's just assume I'm smarter than the average bear. I still can't beat the market. Right. And so what about all the people that aren't smarter than the average bear? Yeah. Or all the people that think that they're above average drivers that fall prey to the Dunning-Kruger effect? You know, so, so we do fund those because the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect is, yeah, I'm sorry. As, I, as, I, as we make big, yeah. Yeah. big yeah. giant yeah. eyeballs. Yeah. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect is where you think that you are better than the average person with no actual reason to believe it. So the, the common one is what 93% of people think that they're, that they're above average drivers. <laughs> That's the Dunning Kruger effect. Like, oh, I drive. That guy's an idiot. I must be a good driver. Dunning Kruger. Um, and so there are a lot of people in the market that are falling victim to the Dunning Kruger effect that think that, that they can out that they watch two shows on, on CNBC. They see Jim Cramer going bye 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 so 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 and hey, I can do that. And, and they, they also fall victim to something else called apophenia. Which is, you know, the numbers that go across it and the ticker on CNBC? I think he's making up words now, Brandon. No, nope. <laughs> A-P-O-P-H-E-N-I-A, apophenia. It is where you start to see patterns and numbers that don't have patterns. Or you're at the roulette table and it's been read the past seven times. Oh, yeah. 
it must be red next, or it's gonna be gr- it's gonna be green because you know, or no, red, black. It's gonna be black reversion to the mean. That's where you're seeing patterns where patterns don't exist. Um, so you know we fall prey to all these behavioral biases when we invest, and, and you can fall prey to them in, in, in real estate investing too. But if you've got enough experience, that's what you've been doing for a long time. You know how to swing a hammer. You know how to run a deal. Why would you invest in something that you don't know about? That, the reason that we invest in index funds in our in our IRAs is because that is what we will use when we get older to fund our our lifestyle. You know, when when we're in our sixties, we don't want to have properties anymore. We start to slowly decumulate our properties and sell them off. We'll have this nice batch of money that we can live off of. So that's our that's for the future. The 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 income from the rental properties is for now and for the, the immediate future, but it is a good ballast so that, that later on, when you don't want to deal with real estate, you've got it there. It's already set up. You're taken care of. Nice. You nice. know, you know, oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I just, uh, I just learned about ba- Baccarat and, uh, I was at a casino a couple months ago with my buddies and it's a fascinating game. If any anyone listening gambles and you've never tried mini bock, it's it's actually really fun. But the whole thing with baccarat is like you're you're trying to find these patterns and 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 you know basically it's a two way bet. You bet for the banker or you bet the other way. And 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 you got these guys and there's these cards and they're charting all this oh, stuff. Yeah. And it's like oh you're trying to find patterns. And I play it. I have fun. And you know I'm like what the hell are you doing, guys? I mean this is. <laughs> It's a flip of a coin. You're literally yep. looking at a coin flip, and you cannot chart a coin flip. And and yep. you know, I I think a lot of people fall victim to the fact that you know investing in a lot of things is really just a coin flip for you, unless you understand the business. And 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 I think yep. that's why uh, Warren Buffett is is one of the most admired people. You know, if you think back to when the the stock market bubble was happening, and Buffett's like. Uh, I'm 2000 or so. I was a stock trader back in the day, so I used to really watch the market closely. But he's like, dot com, I would never invest in a dot com. I don't get it. I don't understand how it works. I don't care how crazy these prices are going. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to invest in Coke. I'm going to invest in the railroads, you know, whatever it is, insurance, um, because it's predictable, understandable to him. And and I, I think it's a it's an important point. You know, don't don't go spreading your money into things that you don't get just because somebody else tells you to. Hey, I got this latest and greatest thing. You should back me. Don't do it. I've mm-hmm. done it. I've been burned. Um, and and you know, I hate seeing people lose their money. I remember, you know, my mom. I I know so many people who lost their shirts because they were investing based upon advice of some financial advisor or stockbroker or somebody else who said this is the hot thing. Or you know, if you don't get it, if you don't understand it, if you don't really get how it works what are you doing and you know chances are if you know something and, and you're really good in an area you can leverage that knowledge into profit easier by starting a small business by doing something else consulting whatnot than by investing in stock so i was uh the company that i sold does um search engines for websites and so if you go to Zappos and you look for red shoes and you find red shoes, that's what we did. Um, and so I knew that industry cold. And there was one company called Autonomy that we had a pretty easy time stealing their customers because they, it was hard to work with. It was kind of clunky. It was outdated, blah, blah, blah. And Autonomy was a public literary company. And if I had to use my insider knowledge, I mean, legal insider knowledge to, to say short autonomy, I'd have gotten killed because HP paid over the moon for autonomy. Yeah. So even though you know something, you can't control it. And yeah. to me, in order to, to be successful and to profit off of your, your investments, you have to have differential knowledge and you have to have control. Do you have and control in real estate? You can control the deal. Yeah. You certainly can control the deal. You can control your tenants. You can control what sort of improvements you make. You can control what sort of property manager you use. Sure. Can you control 100%? No. Right. You can't control 100% anything, but you can control a lot of the variables. Whereas in, in investing in stocks, 
you might have differential knowledge, but you don't control the psychological behavior of every other investor in the market. And yeah. so that's why I index fund. And that's why people buy real estate who, who that's by, why people who get that buy real estate. You know, when, yep. when, when over the years that, that I've been doing this, you know, I think that's one of the biggest uh, psychological reasons that I tend to hear from people is I have some control of my destiny with real estate. Yeah. I don't have yeah. control with anything else. You know, I can yeah. set the price that I pay. If I don't want to pay it, I don't pay it. You know, I can, I can, you know, I, I can control a lot of factors and, and mitigate my losses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with enough experience, you can say with a reasonable set of expectations, what is it that I can get if I sell it? What can I rent it for? How much will it cost me to, to improve it? And then you can back into how much do I want to pay in order to get the, the return that I'm looking for. And you also know when you have enough experience that that deal that looks so great that you want to jump on isn't the only deal that's ever going to come around. Yeah. You know, another another trait that I, I like about real estate and not that we want to make this, you know, obviously the real estate versus stock show, but in real estate and with small business, so you'll appreciate this, is that you can leverage creativity in place of cash where you can't do that as well in other industries like yeah. stocks or in index funds, things like that. Like you, I mean, you can do a little bit of leverage obviously, but mm -hmm. that that's why I, I like to recommend if people are interested in real estate, if they've got five grand, they could do so much more with that five grand in real estate than they probably could anywhere else. Now they, they could lose it also very, very easily, mm -hmm. but $5,000 towards uh you know, towards, I don't know, direct mails, sending it out to, to motivated sellers, things like that. You could turn that 5,000 into 20 or 30 yeah. fairly easy because it's a business. It's not a yeah. investment. As yeah. Much. I mean, if, if you've got $5,000 and you can, and you can contact a bunch of motivated sellers and you can get in contact with people with money, you can, you can get in the middle where money changes hands. Yep. And that's, that's the way I make money. And, and I mean, that's the way I make money in any business. It doesn't matter if it's real estate. It doesn't matter if it's financial planning. It doesn't matter if it's software development. If you can get in the middle when money exchanges hands and take a little bit of it, then you're in good shape. Either that or you have to be able to create value. So if you can take the $5,000 and go in with someone and, and be the person that paints and, and sands and does all the work, you know, you buy the material, you do all the work, and the other person is frying the finances, and then you split 50-50, you're probably going to get a pretty decent return on your cash. Yeah. Yeah. We talked actually with Mike Simmons a few weeks ago on one of the, uh, I think it was episode 50. He talked about that's how he flips houses. He partners with people on a 50 50 deal and they provide 100% of the financing and the repair costs. And he manages the whole deal from beginning to end and they split whatever they're made at the end 50 50. And so he's leveraging his creativity for his uh, not using cash. And it's, it's a fantastic business model. I, I love that model. So. Very cool. It's also it's also really nice to hear. I just want to add, like, I don't have a 401k. I don't even like fund my Roth IRA or I don't do any of that. And I, I always feel bad. I'm like, oh, I really should. I should take, you know, but it's nice to hear you say, you know, I know I can like, I know I can get 20 to 30% return on my money right now in my market. I know for a fact I can get 20% without even like having to try that hard. So it, it hurts me to put that into a you know, a stock or a mutual fund that I know is not going to earn more than 10% or, you know, so I don't know, it makes me feel better to hear a, you know, a qualified person tell me I'm okay. So I, I would say, and, and this applies to, to all your listeners is if you can, if you are eligible for it is open a Roth IRA and put a hundred bucks in there, or whatever the account minimum is. And the whole reason for that is that there's a five year time frame that um, a Roth IRA has to be open and funded for five years before you can withdraw your contributions tax-free, mm. or uh, I'm sorry, penalty-free. And so, you know, even if you just put a hundred bucks in there, your clock starts. And so in five years, it can become your floating liquid fund, your emergency fund if you need it, because then you can withdraw the contributions penalty-free because you've already cleared your five-year window. That's a great and tip. And because of the way that the taxes go, it... It winds up being three years and eight months if you do it right. But um, yeah, so if you can open up a Roth IRA and you're eligible, do it. Okay. Because um, that money, the, uh, here's, here's the difference between investing in the stock market and investing in, in what you know in real estate. Is that, uh, let's say you fund a Roth IRA. Let's say that you meet the income thresholds and you fund a Roth IRA. And you pay the taxes now. 
you are done paying taxes. So in 30 or 40 years, when you're, when you're at Social Security and you're trying to manage for tax thresholds so that you don't have, you know, you don't go into the next tax bracket, you've got this pile of tax-free money that is available to you. So there are advantages, there are tax advantages for doing some investing in the market in IRAs just so you've got those kind of tax deferred or tax free options later down the road. Yeah, and just so people know, like I'm not saying I, I'm not going to do that. Like I, I want to. I still feel bad that I don't do it. But lately, the last few years, it's just been like it's like you know Kmart blue light special around here. So it's really hard for me to take that that five grand and max out my Roth for the year when I know where that do I you can... invest? <laughs> Podunk, what Washington. Town is it? Podunk, Washington. Is that what you call it? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. So anyway, that. That, that, but those are the best places. Podunk, Washington is the best place to invest <laughs> oh, yeah. because, oh, yeah. because there is an informational disadvantage. There's probably two or three good old boys that know everyone. Yep. That would be and, <laughs> I'm the good old yeah, boy. No, Brandon is he's literally, he's literally like the second most famous person <laughs> in his town to the mayor. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's where Not you want to be. I mean, I, you know, I, w- I would rather invest in Podunk, Washington as a, as a real estate investor then invest in, say, Atlanta, where it's probably everyone's an educated buyer. There, any distress is going to be pounced upon by 50 investors. You, know, that you don't have that, that informational advantage that you can act on in some of these, in some of these markets. So, I mean, yeah, well, I want to live in Podunk, Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, see? I, I like my small town anyway. <laughs> no, but I, I, I agree. I want to, you know. I agree completely. The rural, the rural thing is, uh, you know. Oh, I and I mean that's where our real estate portfolio is is rural. Yeah, rural. We, we're invested in rural. We live in urban. I mean, we live in downtown Fort Worth, but it's all of our investments are in rural because that's where the informational advantage is. Yeah, there you go. All right. So as as we come to a close here, uh, we we've got a, a section of the show that we like to call our. It's time for the fire round. Fire. Oh, As that, opposed that, to pyre, it's fire. Yeah, the, and, and that was your Beavis and Butthead rendition of oh, oh, Fire Round. Fire! <laughs> <laughs> all right, so the, these questions all came uh, from the Bigger Pockets forums somewhere in there. A lot of them are kind of personal finance questions because you are a personal finance pro, but uh, they're all kind of relating to real estate as well. So these questions were just going to fire at you, and you get to fire them right back at us. Number one. Pay off debt first or invest in real estate? Pay off debt. Oh, good. There you go. Um, Do you want me to explain why? No. Or, uh, no, how, no. how scary is, is this fire? I, I was just, I was just, yeah, I was curious too, Brandon. I mean, because that was probably the most terse response we've like, ever had. I, that's what I like about the fire round though. And now we're, we're going on about it. <laughs> Bloviating. No, no, I, right. I think that's great. I mean, that, I like quick answers. There you go. All right. So how do I buy on an online auction site? Well, I just did this. I, this is my second one that I've purchased. Um, so uh, I use auction.com. There are others. I think Williams Transon. There are some other ones. But I use auction.com. Uh, I narrowed down the area that I was looking for and, and applied kind of the same rules, the same bigger, bigger pockets, uh, rent rules, and, and purchase price rules. Um, but then I used a little psychological trick. So... What happens with the auction.com auction is when you make a bid, um, it extends the auction by two minutes. So if, if you're trying to be a sniper right at the end and, and get the last bid in, um, and it emails you when you've had your bid beaten, um, but the email lags. It takes about 30 minutes for you to get the email in. So instead of bidding early, what I do is I wait until the very last second and I put in my bid. Because if the person win- was winning and doesn't know it and isn't watching, they'll get beaten without notification. Nice. Good tip. That's, a, that's very sneaky of you, Jason. Oh, I am very, <laughs> very sneaky. It's a very good, uh, very good idea. All right. So uh, do you have any other quick tips on, on uh, how to uh, buy at an online auction beyond that? Because I think that's an awesome tip. Yeah, no, although the uh, the closing, you have to have your money ready. Uh, they are going to want you to close usually within 15 business days. 
Um, they're going to want a wire of at least a down payment right away, if not the full purchase price. There are a lot of them that are all cash, but those are usually the best ones because there are many, many fewer buyers in those than in the uh, financing accepted. Um, so I tend to troll the uh, the cash only ones because the the pool is a lot smaller of people I got to beat. And and you know we're totally screwing up this fire around here because <laughs> I got more questions for you. What, what what typical price range are you looking at on these online auctions? Uh, for me, it's it's in the forty to sixty thousand range, and I can rent those out. You know, I mean, you usually have to do probably ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of repairs. I mean, they are foreclosures for a reason. Um, but I can rent those out for a thousand to twelve hundred a month. Nice. So you're getting the two percent rule. That's good. That's close. Nice. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's good. That's very good. Um, cool. All right, Josh, are you content? <laughs> I'm, right. always never content. <laughs> I'm always content. Always <laughs> content. All right. The third question. I'm in the military, based overseas. How can I invest in U.S. real estate? Save your money. Um, I, I was I was stationed in Germany. Um, and uh, one, you don't want to invest overseas because you're going to be a true absentee landlord. You're going to have to deal with their property laws. You may have to deal with uh, FBAR and FACTA. Um, so what just are, save your money. I don't. What? Uh, F FBAR and FATCA are the two rules that have to do with um, with expatriation and repatriation of money from overseas. Uh, and it's the reason that a lot of banks don't want to deal with U.S. expatriates is because once there's more than $10,000, there's all this reporting requirement. It, it's anti-money laundering, basically, is what they're looking for. Um, okay. So you don't want to have to deal with all that, um, especially if you're not a national of the place that you live in. So save up your money. Um, you know That way, when because you'll PCS, I mean, eventually you'll come back to the States, and then you'll have opportunities. Um, and, and that way, if you if you stack up all your money, you can be a cash buyer. And cash buyers, to me, have much better negotiating leverage than the finance buyers. I mean, it's, there's nothing more powerful than going up to a distressed seller and saying, "Hey, I can offer you X, and I can close this week because I got the money." Yeah, that's that's very true. I haven't been in yeah. that those shoes yet, but you'll yeah. get there. You'll get there. <laughs> nice, nice. I mean, that's what you're aiming for, really. You yep. want to be at that point because then. You know, I can I can undercut a finance buyer by fifteen percent because of the uncertainty. You know, it will the loan close? Will it get funded? How long will it take? Will I get foreclosed on before then? I can say, hey, I can solve your problems this week. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and the the other interesting thing about the the, the question, um, you, you know, we we've got we've got some active military guys who who started their careers while they were overseas and. You know they they encourage it, and, and I think there's a good argument to to both sides. But you know it, it reminds me of the house that's actually behind mine. Uh, this house has been for sale now. I I don't even know how many months. I mean it's it's uh, you know nine months, ten months. Who knows? Well, everything else is turning quickly. This thing's been on the market. The owners are overseas. They they're Germans. They live in Germany, and and they've relied on this property manager slash real estate agent to to kind of take care of it and and handle it. And she's an absolute and utter disaster. Every decision that she's made has been a bad decision, and it breaks my heart because I've reached out to them and said, "Hey guys, you know this is what's happening, and it's wrong, and you need to." You know, do this, and they're like, "Well, you know, we trust her. This is supposed to be an expert. She's a licensed real estate agent, so she knows everything about everything." And you're just watching their money just sink. You know, they got to mm -hmm. pay the note, they got to take care of all this stuff, and they they can't get out from under this property, and it's heartbreaking. And mm -hmm. and and it's all about their inability to manage at a long distance. Yeah. And, so, and if if you're going to do long distance management, then you better know the area that you are trying to manage. So, you know, we have one condo in Charlottesville, Virginia. We have a great property manager. You know, I, I trust that everything will, will work itself out in the end when we sell it. Um, but we know that area. We lived there for 12 years. You know, I, I wouldn't want to try and invest in an area just because someone else said, oh, hey, Podunk, Washington's a great place to invest in. <laughs> Yeah, stay There's away. so much more risk. You know, you may get the same numbers, but the downside is so much greater because 
if it doesn't work out, these people in Germany, they're mentally committed. You know, the, the, the switching costs of finding someone else who is arguably better. I mean, you could probably swing a dead cat and find a better realtor, yep, but yep. for them, they don't know that. Yeah. They think I've got to, I've got to fly to, you know, back to the US, I've got to spend a week, I've got to interview everyone, we have to go through all this paperwork, blah, blah, blah. It's this enormous mental hurdle, and they're not comparing it to the thousands of dollars that they're losing as a result of a, of a poor decision. So yeah, I mean, the flip, the flip side applies. You know, if, if you are, if, if you know an area and you've got a couple of properties and then you're going to PCS to Germany and you've got a property manager who's worth a crap, that's fine. But if you're trying to start from Germany or from Korea or Japan or whatever and invest in the U.S., just bide your time. You know There will be deals when you come back. They aren't going away. Hey, really quick, what's PCS? Uh, permanent change of station. So the military people will know what that means. Gotcha. Um, it's, it's when you go from one post or fort or base to another one. Gotcha. Um, and, and I do want to point out really quickly that uh, Podunk, Washington is now officially <laughs> the new Detroit. <laughs> Thank you for so so Brandon will be buying houses for a hundred dollars. That would be that would be nice. That would be yeah. Wonderful. There you go. All right, la- last question in the fire round. Yeah, it's r- running a little long here, but uh, Roth IRA, regular IRA, Roth four hundred one k. Which is uh, which is better? Which is best? I prefer the Ross. In the absence of any other information, I prefer the Ross. And and the reason for that is because of the flexibility that it affords you when you're in retirement to manage your taxes. Gotcha. Cool. Gotcha. Perfect. Cool. And also, you know, once you once you have that five year seasoning in a, in a Roth IRA, it serves as your emergency fund if you need it. Nice. I'm gonna go open up nice. a Roth IRA with a hundred bucks today. Just because yeah. you said I'm gonna so. go. And remember, it's the it's the contributions that you can withdraw a penalty free. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Not the earnings. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so you're you're thinking about money, and I'm thinking about a steak. He's talking about seasoning. I'm I'm thinking about getting getting some some food here. Sp- speaking of that, you ever had Johnny's seasoning? They sell it out here on the West Coast. The most amazing seasoning in the world. It's incredible. Yeah, try it out, Johnny's it's from Odunk, Washington. It makes it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little do we know that Johnny is Brandon's best. No, friend. no, just, they- he just got <laughs> a free commercial on the air. Nice job, Johnny. No, they sell this stuff for like like three dollars at Costco for like a sixty ton jar of it. It's it's incredible. <laughs> there will be twenty five links to Johnny's seasoning in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mo- mo- moving on. It's time for our famous four. All right, these are the famous four. We ask every guest these questions. Number one, what is your favorite real estate book? I don't know that I have a favorite real estate book as much as a class of books, and that would be any book that teaches you how to be handy around the house. So as a beginning real estate investor, I I think you do not want to pay other people to do what you could do yourself. So learn how to paint, learn how to sand, learn how to hang drywall, Etc. There's books, there's YouTube videos, whatever it takes to get yourself that baseline knowledge. You know, you don't have to be a carpenter, but if you can rip out drywall, rip out cabinets and replace them and, you know, put in flooring and paint, you can add value. So that, that would be, you know, that baseline of education, whatever it is, wherever you get it. I don't have a personal favorite, but I have a personal favorite class. Nice. I learned all my stuff from the, uh, Home Improvement One Two Three book from Home Depot. It's the big orange one they have on their yeah. shelf. Yeah, I learned almost yeah. everything from that book. And and go to those free Home Depot classes. And Lowe's offers them too. You know the Saturday morning classes where you can learn the basics. Great go. tip. Great there you tip. Go. Now, m- meanwhile, some will argue that that is not a good use of time swinging a hammer. But uh, the, we we've covered that in in other po- podcasts. I mean, I I think. Yeah, let me let me if you don't have money, then you trade time. Yeah. You Once go. you have money, you know, I don't I don't do any repairs. Yeah. But that's because I can I have a higher value in use of my time. But if I was twenty five years old and just starting out, yep. darn skippy, I will learn yep. that stuff rather than about the credit card and dive further into debt and risk to to have someone else do it. Yep. Good point. Good well point. well played. Well played. All right, sir. Favorite business book. Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey. Um, really? And, and ironically, um, he wrote in his book, um, 
a lot of the stuff that, that I was trying to implement in my company. So it could just be, you know, again, attribution bias, like, oh, I did this, and then Dave Ramsey says it's good, therefore Dave Ramsey is good. <laughs> uh, I don't I I don't agree with his investing advice. I don't agree with all of his personal finance, but Entree Leadership was a good book. Uh, the second one is The Goal. Uh, and I forget who the author is, but it's it it it, it teaches you how to run a business. Um, and I think real estate investors need to think about I am in a business. I run a business. Um, and you need to think about profits and PL statements from the get-go. And so the goal uh, for how to think of it that way, and then entree leadership as you start to expand or as you have your team. So you've got your property manager and your handyman and, and whoever, how do you treat them? How do you make sure that they are aligned with you to make sure that you succeed? Is that is that the book by Eliyahu Goldratt? Yes, yes, that's it. Wow, well, look at Josh. Yeah, he can there'll Google. be a link in the show notes. I'm really good with Google. Yep. <laughs> yes, there'll sir. be a link in the show notes after the 25 Johnny Appleseed Spice. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny seasoning. Com slash show 53. There you go. Yep. All, All right. right. All right. Uh, f- let's see. So, uh, what, what about uh, hobbies? You know, what, what do you do for fun? Um, I'm a huge soccer fan. We went to the world cup in 2010 in South Africa. Uh, oh, we're wow. not going to Brazil, but, um, I am a huge, huge soccer fan. Um, I, I like to be active. You know, I'm your typical go to the gym three or four times a week type of guy. Um, and, uh, I like to cook. I suck at cooking, but I'm getting better. Uh, I read Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Chef, nice. so I'm trying to use all of his little slow cooker and slow carb recipes. I Wait, there's it, a four uh, hour. There's a four hour chef now. There yep. is. I yep. made his steak the other like I don't know the month or two ago. I made the, the sexy time. Steak. Yeah, the sexy time steak. It was incredible. Yep. I mean, the best steak I've ever had, I, hands down. It, is it because of the steak or was it because of the sexy time? I, it, I don't know. It was a combination. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent steak though. Yeah, people check that out. Yep. I, I, I make a fajohado or feijoada once a week. I don't even know what it is. It's, it's, it's another uh, word he made up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the Brazilian national dish. So if you look at the table of contents and you go on recipes and then you go uh, main courses, it's one of those. Nice. It's a slow cooker recipe. I'll check it out. Yeah, I have it sitting well, in my cupboard. That was a quick tip. Feijoada. I'm glad the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast has become Brandon and Jason talk oh, cooking. Yes. You know, if, so if you're successful in your real estate investing endeavors, the rental income will pay for your lifestyle so that you can cook nice things and don't have to eat ramen cakes. You or go. you can go out to eat. It's your choice. Nice connection. You know? <laughs> Good connection. Doing well. Well done. Doing, well making done. smart choices, being wise with your investments, and having a good rental portfolio really does buy you a lot of lifestyle choices that you might not otherwise have because you think I've got to have a job or I'm dependent on the stock markets, fluctuations. You know, it does it does buy you that lifestyle after a while, but you're not going to get there the first day. Right. You know, I, I've been doing this, I'm 40 now. We've really been actively investing in, in real estate for the past seven or eight years. And, and I had to build and sell a company to get there. You know, it's, it's not a an overnight win but if you do it right it does buy you a lifestyle that that you can enjoy so that you can do these cooking things or whatever that's yeah, cool yeah by by the way since we're on the topic i did get a nice vitamix for christmas and and wow. that is a bad machine right there <laughs> so you're juiced i i am i am <laughs> juiced i am i am soup Making that thing is insane. So you know, for any anybody listening, you know it's expensive as all hell and well worth every penny that you spend on it because that thing is not a blender. It's like a rocket ship. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, yes. final question. Let's get away from the food cooking. Final question: What do you believe sets apart the successful investors from those who give up and or fail or just quit or never get started? Uh, uh, it's different things. So the people that never get started, uh, they, they never overcome fear. Um, you know, you're always worried that that first investment that you make is going to go straight to zero and, and you have to overcome that because otherwise you're going to stuff your money in the mattress and 20 years from now that money buys you half of what it buys you now. So you have to be willing to take risk and, and you can't get reward without the risk. 
Um, I think what separates over the long term a better investor is one, if you're investing in the stock market, you're not trying to beat the stock market. Um, over time, you will lose. That is a loser's game if you're trying to beat the stock market. For real estate investors, it's you're, you're not chasing deals. It, you set up your process, you set up your numbers, you understand your parameters, and then you only pull the trigger when you find a deal that meets those parameters. Yes. And if, if you have to go six months, a year, 18 months without pulling a deal, so be it. Yeah. That's fine. There will be other deals. Um, so don't fall victim to the thought of, oh my God, I have to do a deal. You don't have to do a deal. You have to have a process and abide by the process. If you do that, then you expose yourself over time to high probability outcomes and enough of those and you'll wind up winning. Good advice. Good advice. Nice job. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jason. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure uh, somewhat. <laughs> Depends on who's listening, yeah. huh? You like how I pick a if fight? Still with, around. <laughs> I'm picking a fight with the uh, with the army guy who who can squash me. Although you know, I, I th- I'm shocked that Brandon hasn't yet challenged to see who can <laughs> kick if you can kick your butt. Well, um, we already know the the results of that one. You know? uh, yeah, that one. You know, I, I boxed in college and I floated <laughs> like a bee and stung like a butterfly. Nice. Uh-huh. Nice. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. All right, man. Listen, it's been a pleasure. Definitely appreciate you being on the show and, and want to thank you for uh, for participating on Bigger Pockets and, and, and you know, just being a part of the community. We really do appreciate the involvement. And uh, so uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. And thanks to everyone who's actually stuck out all the way to the end listening to this podcast. Nice. All right, everybody, that was Jason Hull. Hopefully, uh, you picked up a couple interesting tips, both in the real estate and personal finance realm. I, I thought there was certainly some some interesting strategies that Jason undertook, and, and uh, we absolutely appreciate him coming on board. I know Brandon is walking away not only with new recipes, <laughs> but uh, also with a, yeah, I'm gonna go, a new account to open up, yeah, right? I'm going to go open that Roth IRA with a hundred bucks today. Do it. I Do will. It. Yeah, listen. I mean, I think if if people walk away from from our shows with with just one piece of advice, then I think it's well worth the time they spend listening to them. And I know that I do. So hopefully others do as well. Uh, so again, thanks to Jason for for coming on board. Otherwise. This is show 53 of the Bigger Pockets podcast, and you can find the show notes at biggerpockets.com slash show 53. Um, we want to thank everybody who has been active on Bigger Pockets of late. The site is starting to really blow up. Lots of action, lots of new folks hopping on. We are at over 150,000 members, over 700,000 forum posts, or is it 800,000? I don't know. It's, it's up there. It's up there. And, uh, it's just uh, it's getting busier and busier, which is a, a whole lot of fun because we're seeing more and more people uh, share their successes and and the quick tip up front about the success story um, was was uh, um, added because of that. You know, it's it's pretty exciting to to see people be successful. Yeah. So thanks uh, thanks to everybody who is engaging. If you're not already doing it, jump on the site, introduce yourself, and and get involved. Otherwise, jump on our other uh, social media channels. Facebook, we, 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 we're starting to share quizzes and, and some kind of uh, interactive stuff, which has been a lot of fun. Um, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, so on and so forth. Get involved, uh, connect with us. And, and you know, I, I don't ask this often, but we do hope that you'll spread the word about Bigger Pockets. We really do. Um, the more, more people we can get on board, the more uh, smart folks there will be to uh, to help us all be successful. So uh, you know, please do help us out and spread the word about BP. Uh, otherwise, lastly, if you have not already, please jump on iTunes and leave us a review and rating about the show. Something honest. Um, you know, you can rate us however you want. Just just be truthful and and let people know what you think. We uh, we appreciate it either way, and we work hard to improve what we're doing and make the show the best show for everybody. So thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking around. And uh, Brandon, why don't you take it away? All righty then. This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 53. This is Brandon and Josh signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. 
If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. You're to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.